to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. I'm Sonny Bunch, culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Keith Phipps. Now, Keith uh, has a new book out, The Age of Cage, Four Decades of Hollywood Through One Singular Career. Uh, very much worth checking out. I actually have three copies of it now. I have the advanced reader's copy. I got a final from the publisher. And then the one I ordered from Amazon arrived yesterday, as promised. By Amazon, so uh, maybe maybe I can maybe I'll give one of these away to, to a lucky listener. We'll see. Um, but Keith joined the AV Club in 1997. Uh, he became its editor in 2004. Later, he launched the influ- influential movie site The Dissolve uh, with Pitchfork in 2013, and served as editorial director for film and TV at Uprocks. Uh, he is currently a regular contributor to GQ, Vulture, and TV Guide, uh, and he uh, runs a Substack with uh, his friend and coworker, uh, former coworker, current coworker, I guess, Scott Tobias. Uh, very exciting. Uh, It's called The Reveal. Go check that out. Uh, We've had Scott on before. Great show. Um, And uh, his work has also appeared in The New York Times, The Ringer, The Verge, The Daily Beast, and Rolling Stone, and on NPR. Uh, Keith, thank you for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. So let's talk Nick Cage here. I uh, am a big fan of Nick Cage, and uh, I think everyone is a big fan of Nick Cage on some level, because he has hit essentially every aspect of the filmmaking universe, the business of film, the the types of films, etc. Talk to me a little bit about uh, your theory of this book and, and how Nick Cage kind of represents what uh, the business of Hollywood has looked like over the last four decades. Yeah, that was kind of, I mean, that's kind of the book in a nutshell. It's like, obviously, I, 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 I enjoy the work of Nicolas Cage. Uh, I think he's a terrific actor and, you know, uh, a handful, you know, a very small handful of movies aside, you know, he's never boring in a movie, even if the movie itself is, is boring. But um, I just kind of, I think it's just such an interesting journey. Like he joins, you know, his career, he, he arrives just in time to catch the, the really just the tail end of, of the seventies auteur, um, directors, specifically just his his uncle Francis Ford Coppola, and, and work in the eighties where where he works pretty steadily. Um, and you know you can kind of see if you move his timeline back ten years, you can see him really fitting into that. But he doesn't really fit into the eighties in a conventional way. He's of the same generation as the Brat Pack, but not really of the Brat Pack or taking those kind of roles. Even in Valley Girl, where he's playing a teenager, he he looks. He, and he is quite young. I think he's nineteen when he made that movie. Uh, he's he's uh, he looks he looks like an he looks an adult. It, does, it doesn't really mm-hmm. uh, the, the movie works, but but th- that element of it uh, seems a little uh, off. Um, but you know the, the you know he, in the eighties he kind of fits in. And, and t- I had to credit uh, my friend Noel Murray to being be, being sort of the spark of inspiration here. Like he, he fits in by being a misfit. That's kind of his element there. You know, and, and rather in. Peggy Sue got married, or Raising Arizona, or Moonstruck. These are, you know, these are not your typical um, heroes. And from there, it's just kind of how he adapts to each era or doesn't adapt. I mean, the last t- last ten years um, saw him exploring the the wilderness of VOD and 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 uh, and red box movies, which is a fascinating place in itself. Uh, he at one point in the nineties, the stars aligned to make him a huge. Uh, a huge box office draw, and but uh, then the kind of, things kind of shifted, and and he never, uh, you know, we'll get into Ghost Rider, I'm sure, a little bit, uh, but he never really found that franchise that kind of would extend someone like a Tom Cruise's career, or you know, everything being IP and franchise driven. You know, if you don't have that kind of safety net, you can keep going back to, um, you know, you're, you're kind of you're kind of struggling. So it, it's I. You know, I think it's a, I think it's an interesting story to to follow from from beginning to to, the, to its present, which is kind of the beginning of a new chapter. Uh, it's not in the book, but I'm looking forward to watching it unfold. <laughs> Uh, we could talk. I, I want to talk a little bit about the the franchise world. We'll get to that in a second because I, I do think it's it's interesting to look at the start of his career. Right, you mentioned uh, his relationship to Francis Ford Coppola. He is uh, a a nephew of of the director of The Godfather's and Apocalypse Now. Um, but the the Coppola name is shed very early on in his career. Mm-hmm. Um, was do, do, looking back at some of the interviews and watching some of these movies. Do you feel like the the Coppola name was like a burden or a boon for him, just in terms of getting work and getting in there. I think it was a boon for him in, in, in the sense that he got some some pretty plum roles in Francis Ford Coppola movies 
early on, but I, th- I think he did really feel the need to shed it. And the interesting story here is that he was cast in Valley Girl by Martha Coolidge, not knowing who he was. He was like the one Coppola she didn't know because she'd worked with Francis Ford Coppola and, and, um, and, and, and others. Um, but, you know, it, it, she saw his picture on, he was, as, she, as she tells it, um, you know, that she was kind of tired of seeing ordinary hunks, um, you know, 80s style uh, leading men. And she saw his picture on the stack of, a, of, of you know, eight by tens and said, get me someone like this. And, you know, he came in, auditioned. It went really well, obviously. And, and she called the set of, of Rumblefish to try to work around his schedule so he could be in this movie. And they said, we don't know who this Nicolas Cage person is. And that's so, you know, his 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 actual breakthrough in, this, in the leading roles is is on the Cage name. But I think there's a lot of tension early on, especially uh, of him trying to prove himself and 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 uh, we will break apart from that and not being seen as Coppola's nephew and he was mocked by it um, by other actors on, on Rumblefish and Fast Times at Ridgemont High as, as he tells it yeah wasn't there there's a story uh, about Eric Stoltz giving him grief he, he would repeatedly uh, for, in interviews talk about how he was mocked by his name asked to say lines from Apocalypse Now and he, he I think he only named the, his tormentor once and that was Eric Stoltz and and I kind of kind of ran with that as a thread through the book uh, a couple of times and 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 people accused me of not liking Eric Stoltz I think Eric Stoltz is a great actor but but I was a little bit <laughs> a little bit of a projection there in terms of feelings yeah, Eric Stoltz is fine. For the record, this is a this is a Eric Stoltz safe space. People, we we like Eric Stoltz. Um, I uh, so so in the in the eighties and in into the early nineties, he's playing these kind of oddball roles, but still uh, working with some great directors. He's working with the Coens, working with David Lynch. Um, what what kind of sets him apart as an actor here and makes him. Uh, sets him sets him up for this like career as like a a big leading man in the 90s this is tough to say because i in in some ways it's just kind of the early spending the early 90s in a steady stream of 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 good work or mostly in and mostly in films people like but the weird thing about it is the early 90s he's kind of shifts into nice guy role um Mm. you know i I write about this quite a bit in the book and people he won't be remembered as like a Jimmy Stewart like ordinary guy in terms of in you know as a star of like comedies like Honeyman in Vegas and and it could happen to you um but he was quite good at it and 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 quite successful those movies you know did did quite well um uh, i mean the shift happens he he was already caught cast in the rock uh when he won best actor for leaving las vegas but uh, it just seemed like there was a, a, a new interest in working in that sort of films and a new interest in hiring him for, for bigger films. I, I think what kind of gets overlooked sometimes is his role in the film Kiss of Death, which is Barbate Schroeder's remake of the classic noir, uh, where he just gives a really intense performance that kind of upstages its essential star, David Caruso. Um and, you know, if you look at the reviews at the time, there is just sort of this consensus that Nicolas Cage is one of our, our best actors. Um, and it, it kind of, these things kind of tend, sometimes these things culminate and, and that leaving Las Vegas and the acclaim he got for that very, very good performance uh, seemed to be the culmination of it. And then action stardom, which is, which felt, yeah. you know, someone who was there at the time, it felt like a weird next step. Um, it certainly really worked out for him in, in the near term. Um financially and i and those movies have have held up really well but it is not necessarily where you see the nicholas cage of wild at heart or raising arizona going if, if you've you know you are inter- introduced to him by 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 those movies yeah there's a there's a quote from michael bay that you have in your book and i want to read it because i think it it gets a, a very uh gets to the heart of the shift in nicholas cage's persona at this point right uh, so here's here's bay talking about the uh he's editing the rock at this point uh, quote, but people were saying this is a movie that will make Nick Cage a movie star. And there's a difference between being a great actor and a movie star. A movie star is someone that has appeal around the world that people want to see a movie because this actor is in it. Uh, end quote. And so so this is this is a big distinction that I think I think people implicitly understand, but don't always think about really the difference between actor and movie star. When when he makes that shift in the you know, really in the early 90s, because I do think that 
those uh, those rom com type films, uh, Honeymoon in Vegas, and um, it could happen to you are are part of this shift as well, where he is an appealing presence that people want to see on screen. What is how does this shift kind of define this next part of his career? You know, I think in some ways to be in in, in something like The Rock, you have to be appealing point of ident- identification in some ways, and he certainly had done his time as that as, as playing ordinary guys uh in the in the early 90s uh but you know i i've never you know despite you know studying this closely and writing this book i, I don't know that i can crack what set you know what makes a great actor also a movie star it, it is kind of some weird x factor and and i think with cage you can kind of see that obviously there's some eccentricities and you can point to he's not he doesn't and he's an actor like not many other actors or not really any other actor uh, that, that sets them apart, but the continued fascination with Nicolas Cage, the, the, the iconization of Nicolas Cage through, through memes and, and, and uh, uh, unlicensed merch and things like that. It's, it's, that's, it's part of movie stardom in some ways. Is the VOD era that he is in now the kind of confluence of movie and movie star and actor at the same time, right? It's, it's not, it, because the reason people watch these movies, let's be let's be frank here. The reason somebody's going to sit down and watch uh, a movie that they see a still of on VOD is because they see Nick Cage's face, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so he is he is attracting people because he is a movie star, but he is also doing like really interesting actorly things in some, even most of these movies, even even something like Jujitsu, which is a I don't think is a very good movie at all, um, and 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 has a lot of problems, but he is doing interesting things in it his performance willie's wonderland another movie that i don't think really works uh except for when he is on the screen and mm-hmm. his like silent demeanor kind of banging away at that pinball machine is like an interesting little thing worth watching on its own is 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 that what is going on with this vod resurgence yeah i mean i feel like um i, I think if you just take all the cageness out of it the VOD uh, market is driven by those recognizable faces. You know, your Bruce Willis's and and John Cusack's and Nicholas Cage. I mean, they're kind of the big ones, but there but there are others. You know, uh, I know this person. I'll I'll watch this movie with them. But I think what makes it, these movies more interesting, as as you point out, is the work he does within them. I, I, early on, um, there's a I think the low point in terms of him his acting is around. 2014, uh, where he's in this movie called Rage, which is just the, the dullest revenge story you can see. Left Behind, which is which is you know a horrific you know horrific fa- adaptation of the apocalyptic faith based novels, where he just doesn't he just seems uncomfortable. But but he's always doing something. I mean, Jiu Jitsu is a really good example because it's it is a um, I like some of the stunt work in it. It is a movie where they obviously didn't have enough money to do what they set out to do. Uh, but here he is giving this big eccentric performance dressed like Dennis Hopper from Apocalypse Now, like a little movie reference to to his uncle's uncle's film. Um, you know, Willie's Wonderland. I, I, you know, you wonder, there, there is a certain amount that he, he brings a certain amount of shaping to his characters. Um, to what degree, it's not always clear, but but it definitely feels like a, a movie taken out, out as an opportunity to do um something really fun i mean that silent performance is is neat the movie looks like it was made in two rooms and a corridor maybe (laughs) with 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 one one light or something i mean it's it's a tough film to it it is a film that nakedly aspires to to cult them but it actually is is kind of a tough watch in some ways but you're right i mean he's 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 fantastic that's i mean i think that's if we want to talk about what a movie star is i think there is that kind of x factor of being compelling just being on the screen jiu-jitsu is actually one of his smaller roles it's it's definitely more of a supporting role um there's a movie he did uh called inconceivable which is like it's a 2017 VOD thing that's kind of a throwback to like your hand that rocks a cradle style uh, thrillers where he's not, you know, he's not really the central center of it. Most of the times he's the center of the movie and he's, and the movie's built around him and, and they're, they're Nicolas Cage films uh, for better, but also sometimes, you know, for worse, but also often uh, more often than he thinks for, for better. Do you think that this is I this is I, again in the, in the in the piece uh, I wrote a couple months back I talked about how 
audiences, general audiences, not not the cineasts, you know, with great taste like you or I, but general audiences, when they hear Nick Cage is in a movie, they kind of automatically dismiss it. Mm. You have to do a lot of extra work to get them interested in a movie like Pig, right? Mm-hmm. Or uh, or. I don't know, uh, some, something in that vein, something that has a little higher uh, aspirations than just being standard VOD um, uh, stuff. Do you do you think that the this I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious what your take is on the general public perception of Cage at this point in his career is. I think it's kind of locked in to a couple of things, kind of locked into this action star years and the years when you're just sort of an inescapable movie star. And I think also to the kind of meme, the meme culture that's built up around Cage, where it's just the biggest moments. You get the super cuts of, of Cage yelling and screaming. And, and, and they uh, if the most famous ones tend to be taken from like two movies where they're, you know, they're over. I'm not saying that he doesn't go to extremes in his performances sometimes, but out of context, it looks different than it does um, within the context of the film itself. Like uh, we screened uh, Matchstick Men last night here at the Music Box for, for a book event um, and kind of an underrated, overlooked film um, directed by Ridley Scott. And there is a scene you can pull out of that where he's freaking out at, at a pharmacy because he wants a prescription uh, and and you know it's it's a it's a laugh moment when he just loses his mind on a, on a, someone else waiting in line. But in context, it's you know it's it's it makes a it's the film's been building to this moment in many ways of, of him just finally snapping. Um, you know, I, I I feel like there's sort of like this unfair arrested idea of what Nicolas Cage is that the performances themselves often don't bear out. Yeah, do you uh, you at one point you in the, your book you describe these as irony tinged appreciations, mm-hmm. which I think is a I think is a a good way to kind of get at the phenomenon. Do you think this is? Uh, I I can look at it both ways, right? I can see it as both being is either being helpful in keeping him in the public mind or hurtful in like making people kind of dismiss his work as a, a collection of ticks and outbursts. Yeah, I mean, I think he said as much that 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 uh, in in some interviews that it's kept him in circulation but also kind of change people's perception of him and i imagine that's that's kind of tough to do uh kind of tough kind of tough to bury is like you know you're kind of tough uh sorry kind of a tough burden to bear uh if if you you know you don't are they coming out why are they are they coming out to laugh at me are they coming out because they love me or is there's like there's some as i think is more often the case some sort of confusion between the two where it's like you're you're drawn to the over top over the top this that kind of makes it funny but i think unless you're not you know you're watching through a, a thick thick um veil of irony uh, it's hard not to see that, that, that there's some real there's a, there's real craftsmanship and 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 some terrific performances in there yeah, yeah. You you mentioned uh, the event at the theater last night. How was that? How was it? How was it to see uh, these movies in with a big crowd? You know, excited there to to see a big Nick Cage performance. So it or was two. I think it was a double feature, right? It was great. Yeah, we did a double feature of Matchstick Men and, and Face Off. And Matchstick Men was just the first one that came to mind because I love that performance and I feel like it's a slept on movie. Um, and then I thought, well, I you know, but will, will people come just for Matt Stickman? <laughs> it's a slipped on movie. So we paired it with face off and they both played great. I mean, face off, you know, I had not seen it in the theater for 25 years uh, when I saw it, when it first came out. And, and the full madness of that film is, is, is he's much easier to appreciate with an, with an audience. Um, and, you know, it works. I mean, you know, there was a lot of laughter but it's not laughing at the film i think it's just laughing at the audaciousness of of of, of this of the filmmaking and the performances I, it's great but i was really delighted that matchstick men played as well as it did i think about about half the crowd had seen it and half had not and you can kind of tell who had seen it and who hadn't based on their reactions to various moments in the film which changes on uh, some some twists and turns um but you know it played it played really well i mean it's it's, it's certainly a film that that i hope more people will will, re, will rediscover and also we had great it was, i was i was you know it's always a we had 35 millimeter prints music box uh theater here in chicago which i which i love uh secured them and but it's always kind of a um crapshoot as to what you're going to get and 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 their uh, matchup was pristine it was like an opening night print and then and, and mm-hmm. face off looked good too 
Yeah. Oh, that's great. I yeah, I it, it, I love those uh, repertory theaters with the the thirty five millimeter prints. You got to love that. Um, the uh, the match. I feel like Matchstick Men has had a bit of a re appreciation in recent years. I feel like people have come come back around on that. That that folks are folks are getting more into it now as a kind of lost Ridley Scott film, or at least underappreciated at the time. Yeah, I, th- I think so. that makes sense. I mean, it was it opened behind uh, Once, Upon, Once Upon a Time in Mexico uh, at the box office. And I, and I put it in the book. It's like, you know, it's not that it's a better film. It's just it's easier to market film, you know, with, with uh, you know, guns and, and, and Johnny Depp and things like that. Whereas Matt Man is kind of a twisty, turny, um, thriller, mystery, thriller, whatever about about a, a con man with OCD, Tourette, some sort of some sort of, of condition, um, and you know I think it was it's one of those things where I, I don't I don't want to be one of those people that, that's like you know movies aren't what they used to be, but I think by the ability to sell a film like that, it kind of started to vanish by by two thousand three when it came out. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about the franchise uh, question here, because Nicolas Cage feels like an actor who should have an anchor franchise. Mm -hmm. He is a big he's a big name. He's a big face. People know him. They like him. Uh, And he's had a couple of shots at it. I mean, the National Treasure series, which you write about, which actually had the sequel did better than the original. Mm -hmm. And yet Disney at one point was just kind of like, ah, we don't know what to do with this. What what happened there? Why why was that? Why do we not have seven National Treasure movies when we have you know eight Mission Impossible movies? That's I mean that's a really good question because I think those movies are super entertaining. As, as one of the producers told it a few years ago in an interview, was Disney didn't know how it wasn't that the movies didn't do well; it's that they didn't know how to turn them into theme park rides. They didn't know how to franchise them. Uh, they didn't know how to to, to do that extra you know it's not enough to have a hit movie anymore you got to have this this you know this multi-armed squid of a, of a property that you can do lots of things mm-hmm. with um and i think it also coincided with a downturn in his career with 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 uh you know cage's um financial troubles were very well known at the time and he'd become kind of a uh an easy punchline um and there was a, an attempt to do a follow-up of sorts with the same director called the sorcerer's apprentice which was a flop mm, yeah. um so there's 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 all that i mean he had more you know in another universe he would have made Superman uh, for Tim Burton and he mm-hmm. was approached about the matrix and Lord of the Rings, which he turned down. I think in large part because he didn't want to be away from his kids for, for his kid for so long um, at this, at this point, both of yeah. which were taken out of the country for long stretches. So, you know, there, there yeah. are, so, you know, th- those ships kind of sailed away. There was ghost rider. Um, I'm not the biggest fan. Ghost rider. Yeah. I'm not the biggest fan of ghost rider. Um, but it also felt like it was too late to catch the first wave of interest in, in superhero movies, and then but too early to be part of the MCU, which I think might have been a good fit for him. But you know, missed, yeah. it didn't quite work out. Yeah, Ghost Rider. I mean, Ghost Rider. It's funny we 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 moved up the uh, the timing on this taping because we both have to go see Morbius mm-hmm. uh, in our respective cities, uh, starring another uh, Oscar winning actor, Jared Jared Leto in in that in that role. But I uh, I it, it is interesting that the the Ghost Rider thing never quite worked out, and it, it's interesting that he is such a huge comic book fan and has not found that comic book property. I mean, he's great in Spider Man Into the Spider Verse mm-hmm. as Spider Man Noir. Uh, there's a funny bit in the Teen Titans Go movie uh, where he he voices Superman. Finally, he finally gets to play Superman, but he really he really hasn't had that uh, that nerd culture thing mm-hmm. work for him. No, he's kind of aged out is, of, of being like sort of of you know he can't, he's, he's he's aged out of being Superman or some of those parts too. So who 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 are you within a superhero universe at, at that point too? And and you know I. I, I um, he also seems less interested in Hollywood f- films these days, uh, although he is in, in Renfield, which is a, a big one coming out. Yeah. And uh, uh, the unbearable weight of massive talent, of course. Right, right. Uh, which, I'm, which is I'm interested in seeing. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen, yeah, did you see it, it at South by Southwest or... or... I, did, I did not. Okay. I have not seen it yet. So uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to see... Uh, how that goes. All right, let's let's talk a little bit about the actual writing of your book here, because I'm curious what your process was. Did you sit down and watch them all 
uh, watch every Nicolas Cage movie uh, and then start writing? Were you watching as you wrote? How did that work for you? I, I with with a rare exception, I watched as I wrote. I wrote, I watched um, early on just to see because I was heavily inspired by by Mandy. Uh, I, a film I, I love and, and it kind of made me kind of set off a light bulb. It was like, there's an interesting story here following this guy's career. Uh, so I watched uh, a couple of the direct to, to DV, direct to, direct to VOD ones, like uh, 211 and the Humanity Bureau. And I did not go back and catch up with them. But otherwise, mm-hmm. I watched it through in uh, chronological order, but kind of researching ahead, you know, so I, I know what was coming and, and have provided better context. And there's a lot of revising in, in this, in this book as well. But, um, but the, the, you know, the, the chunks you see them divided in, in terms of chapters was more or less the chunks in which I watched them and the mm-hmm. VOD thing, mm-hmm. uh, to be honest, and this is probably the best way to do it. It was the VOD era was just consumed like three you know two sometimes three i think at least one day four uh movies at a time <laughs> in the home stretch of this project so your own little uh, nicholas cage vod uh, festival slash marathon it's very lonely just me just me and my cat <laughs> there for a while <laughs> Um, I, and at the, at the back of the book, you have this great little, uh, you have the, uh, hold on. What is it? The K geography, uh, the complete K geography, yeah. a capsule guide to the films of Nicolas Cage, which is a, it's a real throwback to kind of a, uh, Leonard Moulton style, you know, little capsule review guide. What, what was your inspiration there? Uh, the Leonard Moulton style capsule review guides, which I loved <laughs> were a huge inspiration for me as a kid. I, I used to like, um, try to tape anything three and a half and four, or four stars, uh, off of television. So, which means I ended up seeing a lot of movies under, under less than ideal circumstances. Like the first time I tried to watch Nashville, it's like, what is this? This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> he was interrupted every five yeah. minutes for commercials, but, <laughs> uh, but no, I, I mean, I, I, I loved those and I, and I missed them. And, and, uh, you know, that was, um, there's some of those, ca- you know, I think there's a real, beauty to not saying mine are but there's a real beauty to doing a good capsule like uh i i, I honestly think the capsule i don't even know who wrote it i, I don't this probably wasn't malton but like the capsule to dawn of the dead and, and leonard malton is probably one of the most uh, inspirational pieces for my critical <laughs> writing and it's like, probably like uh, 60 words you long or something yeah uh I, I, I am sure you're going to get asked this question on every interview and every podcast, uh, but I'll put you I'll put you on the spot and ask uh, for your favorite Cage performance, not necessarily Cage movie, not necessarily the movie he is in, but your favorite performance that he gives. Yeah, you probably ask me on you know in, in, any given day I come up with a different answer, but but I just immediately went to Port of Call, New Orleans, which I think kind of captures the, a lot of what he does really well that no buddy else does like that there is like there are like the big expressionistic gestures there's dark comedy there's funny moments to it but in the end it, it is he locks into to to the film it, it being a film about you know redemption and and the the cost of it's a film but you know about redemption and the cost of sin and 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 you know how do you crawl out from this behavior um, that's destructive to you, destructive to those around you, and it, can can one like grand gesture um, erase all that? And then it doesn't come up with any easy answers to it. I I, I think that's a terrific movie. The kind of and it also yeah. kind of fell victim to the the you know, memeization of Cage, where it's like it had this really wild trailer that made it look like it was um, just a just a. a, a, a a festival of weirdness when there's a lot of weirdness in it, but there's a lot more going on as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned I, uh, one last thing and then we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll get off here. Um, but the, 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 the question of Nicholas Cage's personal life and his financial troubles and how that has played into perceptions of him is I think, I think kind of key to understanding how people see him, at least in this last part of his career, because I can't tell you the number of times I have recommended a Nicolas Cage movie to somebody and they're like, oh, is this just another one he's he's taken to pay off his taxes? Mm. And I'm like, well, that's, you know, I first off, I wouldn't necessarily be recommending it for that reason. But like but I, I don't think it's I don't think it's fair to him as an actor. Uh, how has that how has that hurt his his? I don't know the, how people see him. I think it's, it's devalued him. It, it, it's made him kind of a, an easy joke, at least for a long time. And, and it, it almost feels like uh, having not seen the film, it feels like the unbearable weight of massive talent feels like uh attempt to, to finally get on top of that joke and, and, and own it uh, and, and sort of control the narrative again. Um, 
I, I've read the screenplay, which is which is quite funny. I am looking forward to the movie. We'll we'll see how it turn it turns out. Um, but you know the. It, it is an easy, but it's also sort of an easy shorthand to you know, or easy way to dismiss somebody's work as well. And it's not and you know, he has been, I think, a little more frank about the fact that there was a lot of money to, to pay off. Um, you know, at the time, he said he paid it off within a few years. But in this GQ profile recently, he, he's pegged last year as, as the year in which he, he paid or a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. which when he finally paid off. Um, but there are, you know. It's not like they were necessarily always had the the pl- they were plum movies, but they're they're the more interesting. You know, in the VOD world, there's some really interesting stuff in there. Even when the movie, there's a lot of like near misses versus absolute stinkers in in, in that uh, stretch of his career. Yeah, and some good yeah. movies too. Uh, I, I mean, there's a few of them I'm really yeah. quite quite fond of. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I had forgotten that um, Joe was a, a, one of these kind of VOD theatrical almost simultaneously. Yeah, uh, releases one of the one of the first um, and uh, a great movie and like mm-hmm. kind of under I think underappreciated because people were like, oh well, this is VOD. What, what? What? Why should I watch this? It felt like an early attempt at a comeback that didn't quite. I think the movie's great, but I think it didn't quite translate into you know, nominations and, and that, that sort of thing that, 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 that the hope was behind, but, but who knows? Yeah. See also pig, mm-hmm. the, the snubbing of pig. How dare, how dare the, Academy yeah, but people saw pig, do. you know, I, I really feel like people, everyone I was talking to them, you know, everyone I talked to about that movie is, 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 is in love with it and really moved by it. And, and uh, uh, I think it, you know, the, the nominations didn't work out, but I think it did what it needed to do in some ways. Yeah. Uh, I always like to close these interviews by asking if there's anything I should have asked, if there's anything you want to say about Nicolas Cage, about your book, uh, about the business of Hollywood and how that is, is shifting. Uh, what what have I forgotten or uh, failed to ask? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't know. You he did, he did a great job. Um, but I mean, I, I... This is not a fishing for compliments question. I, you know, good job, Whatever Sonny. you want to talk uh, about here. Uh, but no, I mean, I, I, I try to stay... I, it's easy to get really bleak about the direction movies are going in but it was kind of always so you know and i I think the perseverance of of someone like nicholas cage and the ability to continue to exist and to do what he does over all these shifts that i cover in the book over the years i think that that itself is is somewhat inspiring and and uh, and a cause for optimism that that um weirdness and provocative work will will find a way somehow yeah. Uh, Keith, thank you very much for being on the show. Again, the, the name of the book is Age of Cage, Four Decades of Hollywood Through One Singular Career. Uh, his substack is The Reveal. Uh, there was a podcast. What is the podcast? Yeah, Next Picture Show, which I do with, with uh, Scott Tobias, who you mentioned before, and Tasha Robinson and Genevieve Kosky, who are, you know, we, we've worked together uh, at the v- AV Club and then at the Dissolve. And, you know, the podcast was kind of an attempt to to keep working together. And, it, and it's, it's, it's proven quite long lasting. And we, we love doing it. If you love movie podcasts, that's a good one to check out. Um, I, uh, My name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, I will be back next week with another episode. See you guys then. Mm-hmm.